This video is brought to you by Squarespace. I don't know what it is, but there's something weirdly captivating about watching someone balance on something thin. There's like an elite level of coordination and focus that goes into balancing. And in my lifetime, I've seen the sport of slacklining completely captivate the world. From people balancing hundreds and hundreds of feet in the air, to doing it blindfolded, and all the way to performing flips. But before we dig into where slacklining is at the moment, and believe me, it's in a crazy place, I think it's really important that we actually look at the history of balancing, specifically on thin things, not balancing to prove that you're not drunk. And that dates all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome, from 700 to 480 BC, with the ancient practice of Phenumbalism, which I know kind of sounds like some weird political movement, but it's actually the art of rope walking. Now, before slackliners kick off at me, just I know slacklining and tightrope is, is it's different. I mean, you are both just balancing on rope, but they are two separate disciplines. There isn't much crossover, but it is super important that we look at the history to give context to the feats that are done today. Yeah! In both ancient Greece and ancient Rome, people loved watching tightrope walkers perform. But because it wasn't a sport, it never saw itself being introduced to the Olympics. And from there, tightrope walking kind of fluctuated in terms of standing in society. It was pretty much completely banned in 5th century France. Like, you weren't allowed to do it anywhere near a church, and it got pretty much wiped out. That would eventually change with Queen Isabeau at her pretty lavish coronation in 1389. And from there, tightrope walking was cool again. All around the world, these royal events would feature people balancing on a piece of rope. And then us Brits got our grubby hands on it. And during the late 1600s, rope walking got associated with slightly less than favourable things, such as pickpockets, con men, ladies of the night, and very quickly, tightrope walking kind of fell out of favour. And it would take about 200 years before tightrope walking would slowly build back its reputation with the legendary Pablo Fink. Pablo Fink would introduce tightrope walking to the circus. We would see them juggling and holding other people and doing harder and harder things. But all of this would be completely dwarfed by a man named Jean-Francois Ravalette, also known as the Great Blondin. And in 1859, our boy Blondie took a little trip over to the Niagara Falls. And this boy managed to somehow pull a cable across the Niagara Falls and walk across it. Not forgetting to pause midway and chug a beer. The Great Blondin was an absolute nutter, and he was known to never wear harnesses or use safety nets. And he went on to cross Niagara Falls over 300 times. But then jump forward 90 years, to 1947 with Felipe Petit. There is somebody out there in a tightrope walk between the two towers of the World Trade Center, right at the tippy top. The Twin Tower Crossing is absolutely iconic. There's documentaries, there's a feature length film about it. It was a super big deal and Felipe would become somewhat of a star. Why did you do this? Um, that's the thousand uh, why in this morning. There is no why. When, when I see a beautiful place to put my why, I cannot resist. Before we go any further with the video, I want to give a massive shout out to today's sponsor, Squarespace. It can be quite a daunting task, the idea of building your own website. And it can be tempting to get a web developer to make it for you. But that can cost you a lot of money. Squarespace is my favorite website building tool. There's a ton of really amazingly designed templates for you to choose from that you can customize to perfectly suit your business. Squarespace is not only affordable, but it's super easy to use. Even I can do it. As well, there's a ton of features. Appointment scheduling, email marketing, e-commerce, there's loads to choose from. So be sure to head over to squarespace.com forward slash Jimmy the Giant to start your free trial today. And to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, use the code Jimmy the Giant. Anyway, back to the video. But you see, these tightrope walkers, they were balancing on a metal cord, tightly bound, and they were using a balancing stick. It was cool, but for some, this wasn't enough. Which leads us to the 80s. The 80s was an interesting time to be alive. Big hair, fluorescent tracksuits, Super Mario Bros. There was a lot going on. But you see, whilst culture was taking an interesting turn, there was a sport growing that was starting to gain a little bit of recognition. And that sport is rock climbing. I know you thought I was gonna say slacklining, but 
Rock climbing was starting to get really popular in the 80s. And there was one place in the whole world that was kind of seen as the mecca of rock climbing. That place being Yosemite National Park. Yosemite has this long history of like nomads, hippies and rock climbers, which is kind of the same thing. And in 1983, a young man, 20 years old, by the name of Scott Balcom, was spending the day in Yellowstone. And he was walking along and he saw these people in a distance, floating a few feet off the air and kind of bouncing around. And Scott went over and approached these rock climbers who were just dicking around with a piece of rope. And those two people were Adam Grawoski and Jeff Ellington. Instantly, Scott was transfixed by what they were doing. And he decided to give it a go himself and found himself balancing on this thin piece of what was rock climbing tubular webbing. These these two lads had taken this material that was used for the harnesses of rock climbing and just tied it between two trees and started balancing on it. And because it wasn't perfectly tight, like a tightrope is, this particular material would leave a lot of slack in the middle. And so when you would balance on it, this thing would be rocking around like an angry donkey. The moment Scott went home, he went to a shop called Sport Shallow and purchased every type of tubular webbing that they sold. Him and his friend Chris Carpenter would go on to experiment with different types of rope, different thicknesses and different tensions to try and find the perfect rope for balancing on. Leading them one day to taking one of their DIY slack lines to a freeway bridge in Pasadena. And in 1984, Scott crossed it. Which, you know, wouldn't be my first choice if I'd been slacklining for one year. I wouldn't think, you know what, let's just put it between a bridge. But it wasn't enough. And so he decided to head back to Yosemite and wrap one of his DIY slack lines between the now infamous Lost Arrow Spire. After stepping a foot onto the slack line, he noped out and just jumped back on the rock. I mean, I don't really blame him. But then two years later, on July 13th, 1985, Scott returned to the Lost Arrow Spire and did it. Somewhere around the middle of the slack line, Scott finally felt focused. He entered this deep flow state where nothing around him mattered. Scott's walk had started to inspire other people, most notably Jeff Carter and Chuck Tucker, AKA Chongo. Both of these guys were, were nuts. I don't just mean because of the things they were doing, but like their personalities. Deep <laughs> like this macho football guy, he was really loud. Walk in the park, baby. And then Chuck was like this far out hippie who, who literally lived in a cave. You have to pay a price in order to see. It's not free. Gotta take risk. However, this weird friendship would go on to push the boundaries of highlining. They would get better and better, they were developing techniques, they were naming moves. I mean, one of the moves now is called the Chongo. The Carter would do his first walk across the Lost Arrow Spire. And a year later, Chuck Tucker would follow. Darren had started to master highlining. And he would start doing the Lost Arrow Spire like casually, doing it back and forth like it wasn't a big deal. And it was around this time where a new kid came on the block, his name being Dean Potter. Dean would become the first person ever to do the Lost Arrow Spire with no safety equipment. When my life is at stake, I have an immediate focus. You know, focus or die. You see, Dean Potter, even to this day, is known as a legend in mountain sports. Not just slacklining, but rock climbing and base jumping. And it would actually be base jumping that would tragically take Dean Potter's life in 2015. But in Dean's lifetime, he would achieve some incredible things. In 2003, Dean would bring global attention to slacklining. And that was when he did the Lost Arrow Spire back and forth with no safety equipment. This one feat would put slacklining on the map. That same year in 2003, Dean won the award for the Alternative Sportsman of the Year. Through the 90s and the early 2000s, slacklining spread across the world. Finding its way to Europe through countries like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Scandinavia, etc. Between 2007 and 2015, we'd start to see slackline companies. Gibbon, Yoga Slackers, and slackline industries would start to make slacklines for the average Joe. And this would help to make slacklining more affordable and accessible. You would start to see it in like yoga communities, and I came across it in the world of parkour. So basically, any community that has a load of weirdos. 
I would say for a lot of people, slacklining was like the secondary activity. In the parkour world, we'd go out for a day of doing parkour and then finish by doing slacklining. Not everyone was a filthy casual like me. Some people would take slacklining itself seriously. People like Alexander Schultz, Nathan Paulin, Danny Mensick. These lot would constantly one-up each other with new records. Longer cables, higher up, blindfolded, you name it. A few of the more notable accomplishments, I have some here. So, Frady Kuhn who crossed a 2.8 kilometer line. Alexander Schultz and Raphael Breedy crossed the crater of Mount Yasur on the volcanic island of Tanna. There was also this really high urban high line, which was, it was done by a lot of people, but that was particularly cool. And there's loads more, but there were some of the ones I liked. And it's not just the act of doing that crossing that's impressive. I mean, to me, I personally can't understand how they do the rope that long. Like I can hardly tie my shoelaces. But then, one man would come along and completely change everything. Andy Lewis, otherwise known as Sketchy Andy. So, you know, Sketchy Andy was doing the usual Highline stuff. He was setting records. He was doing cool stuff. But then Sketchy Andy started to take a slightly different approach to slacklining, which he called trick lining. Not everyone who was good at slacklining was tying them between two mountains and taking a stroll. In fact, most people would just tie them between two trees and balance along it. But like with everything, once the basics are down and you can kind of balance, people would start to challenge themselves with tricks. People would balance on one foot or do this thing called surfing where you bounce side to side. There was a few other tricks, but Andy Lewis would see all of that rubbish and decide it's, it's time to do something actually cool. And in 2005, Andy Lewis would become the first person to do a backflip on a slack line. Yeah. yeah! Two years later in 2007, he did the squirrel backflip. Yeah. Which Nike ended up purchasing from him in 2008 to use in their Olympic advert. Andy Lewis pushed this idea of like trick lining hard. He became the first ever slackline world champion in 2008. He then repeated this feat in 2009, 2010 and 2011, winning champion overall at the Gibbon World Cup series. In 2010, Andy had tried to huck a double backflip from feet to feet on a slack line. He clotted both of his kneecaps, but still he tried. And Andy Lewis would go on to be somewhat of a celebrity in his own regard, with documentaries made about him. And Gibbon made a slack line with him. He had an appearance on Conan after he went on tour with Madonna, which was shown at the Super Bowl in 2012. Oh my God. Oh my God. He's in a dress. You see, not only was Andy Lewis a really good athlete, but he was very charismatic. He was a funny guy with high energy, and when you would see him in TV appearances, he was he was entertaining. You know, they were very concerned about my testicles, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and with his rise to fame, he would bring slacklining with him. And in 2013, slacklining would absolutely peak in popularity. It became recognized worldwide as this discipline of balance and coordination. Slacklining was, was mainstream. It was quite likely around 2013 that you, you probably would have tried it. Or at very least, you would have seen some hippies doing it in a local park. And with the wide range of things you could do with it, like free soloing, high lining, trick lining, it got the attention of Red Bull and they started doing events and putting out videos. All in all, it was, it was getting big. And it wasn't just marketed as like this crazy extreme sport between two mountains. But they managed to market it in such a way that people would use it for like just getting stronger, maybe rehabbing like knee pains and working on their core strength. But amongst the non-casual slackliners, flips on a slackline had kind of become common. And it was mad seeing the new level of tricks come into tricklining. I think there was a bit of an influence from the world of G-Tram where you would see people landing on their chest and their back and like comboing flips together into these sequences. <laughs> And back to Sketchy Andy, he would eventually do a backflip on a high line, which was previously seen as impossible because you, you have a leash, which ended up sparking its own discipline of freestyle highlining. Between 2013, 2014, and 2015, things were looking pretty good for the slack line. And then it started to decline. You see, this is very common amongst what I like to call internet sports. Sports that have gone viral and become very popular because of the internet. You have a ton of these viral clips where people will do crazy things. In a very short space of time, they gain a ton of interest. You'll see the media world, like television and all of that, wanna try and get their hands on this new fad. There might be a reference in some kind of TV show, usually The Office. Now this is called slacklining. 
Oh, oh, this is a stupid okay. activity. I would be embarrassed to be good at it. And then just as quickly as the popularity comes, it goes. And this is very common. Like I know firsthand from the world of parkour. It had a big spike for years and then around 2015, it was kind of over. But there's a second part to this phenomena that I've kind of noticed. And it is that when the sport has kind of fallen off in popularity, the skill level gets higher, like considerably higher. Parkour had a major skill level up from like 2015 until now. Garden Trampoline or G-Tramp, that, that's had the same sort of thing. And I have a theory as, as to why this happens. When the sport blows up, it attracts loads of new people. And with this new influx of people, there's there's new ideas. They might have come from different backgrounds. Be that dance or maybe gymnastics or like parkour or something like that. These new ideas help shift where the sport is going. And when this wave dies down and all the fair weather people leave, the sport has been fundamentally changed. And those people who really love the sport, usually the ones that have been around for a long time, or some new people as well, they then put their foot on the pedal and just take the sport to another level. And from what I can see, I think this happened to slacklining, or it's happening. Jan Roos, in 2019, legitimately landed a double backflip to V. In 2016, we saw this ridiculous video called Forest Beast Drop. A geezer by the name of Benny Schmid would like do parkour, slackline stuff. And there's this guy called Abraham Hernandez who I'm pretty sure is like the best trick line on earth. The stuff he does is just so crazy. And there's this 15 year old whose name is like Shin Kikawa who is using this slackline, which bearing in mind is like that thin, as if it's like a Euro trampoline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes! So you might be thinking, yeah, Jimmy, we get it. The skill level is sick. What they're doing is sick. But what is the actual future of slacklining? Or at least what do I think? Well, to give you perspective, slacklining is still big. It's, it's a big sport. It's not massive. It's definitely less popular, but it's nowhere near as big as it was in like 2013 and 2014. I mean, if you look at some of the best trick liners on earth, they only have a few thousand followers. And I think what's holding slacklining and tricklining, what's holding it back is kind of the content. Like all these people who are good, just post clips to their Instagram. And that's fine because they're athletes. They might not want to be an influencer or anything like that, but there's no one really who is making cool content for slacklining. The sort of thing that could blow it up. The slacklining videos that are out at the moment just feel very insular. They feel like they service the slacklining community and they don't try and reach the average Joe like me. Like I want to see the last person to leave a slackline wins a thousand pounds. Or I don't know, we, we tried to jump across eight slacklines over water. Or like setting a slackline between two moving cars. I just gave you three banging ideas there that no doubt will go viral. I'm, I'm sure of it. But that's the thing. You kind of need people who want to do that. And a lot of the people who do slacklining don't want to do that. They just want to do slacklining. Some people might see all of my ideas as gimmicky and cringy, which I get the argument, but it's gonna make the sport bigger and it would bring more people to it. So I do think that slacklining could get really big again, but it's kind of in the hands of the slackliners. Will they do it? I don't know. But I think it would be cool to see just how far slacklining can go. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. We've got new merch out on jimmythegiant.co.uk. You can massively support me by picking something up there, supporting me on Patreon, or using the sponsor link below. Peace. Peace.